Uh, my first uh, my first day in Lexington here was uh, on uh, the eve of Derby Day in 1941. I was uh, riding in the back end of a truck with a geologist's uh, field trip party from Augustana College. And uh, they had some friends here in, uh, at the university. And, uh, uh, they got us a, a place to put our sleeping bags down in the agricultural exhibition building. I don't know if that's still here, but uh, we were very grateful for that. Uh, to start my talk, uh, we should say what was happening in 1945 in the U.S. Uh, World War II had just ended. And there was a widespread belief, at least in part of the U.S., that the uh, oil supplies in uh, at least uh, continental North America were about to run out. And the uh, it was a Democratic Party then. Uh, started an ambitious uh, synthetic liquid fuels program. This was to involve uh, demonstration plants at several places. That was part of the bad feature because there wasn't any, anything to demonstrate at the time they started all this. And a research and development laboratory at uh, Bruce and PA, which was under construction at that time. And uh, that is where I came, and I was hired by Dr. Storch, who was seen a little bit. And this was an ambitious program, and uh, I'll say a word uh, subsequently about what was going on in the petroleum industry in the U.S. They were, uh, they did some interesting things, so let's see if I can work this. It's got to advance to us, right? Okay, to start out, uh, as of 19, uh, let me take this long. As of 1945, uh, uh, Francis Fisher here, um, for whom the process is uh, named, uh, had retired at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Moheim, as director. And uh, he, he was to die in a year or two. And uh, if you wonder what happened to Trupsch, well, he, uh, he had left Germany. He went to Czechoslovakia to be director of a coal lab, and then he came to the U.S. and he worked for UOP, or Signal nowadays, with Gustav Egloff, and uh, this was sort of a joint deal with the University in Chicago, and it might have been nice, but uh, uh, Trupsch got uh, cancer terribly, and uh, he went back to Germany and died in 1931 or two. And uh, so, anyway, uh, here's. Uh, Fisher's laboratory in uh, Moheim, which is still there in the stone operation, but they don't do the Fisher truck synthesis anymore. They, they do virtually no cold oil work. Now, in Germany, there was, after the war, uh, some additional research done. Uh, Kobo worked with uh, slurry reactors. He claims he got them to work quite nicely. And uh, he developed the Kobo Engelhardt synthesis. This is a synthesis involving uh, water and uh, carbon monoxide. And uh, it works as you might expect with a uh, water gas shift first, and then, uh, something like the Fisher Krupp. Uh, Pischler, who 
was the other. Uh, th these were the two uh, uh, better descendants of Fisher, I guess you'd say. They were Fisher students. And Colbo uh, uh, went to the uh, Technical University in Berlin, and Fischler went to Karlsruhe. But uh, this was after a sojourn until about 1955 with hydrocarbon research in New Jersey. And uh, there he worked on the uh, high pressure synthesis on ruthenium catalysts, the polymethylene synthesis, making uh, essentially polyethylene on hydrogen and CO. And uh, together with uh, Hans Schultz, who is still running the show in Karlsruhe, uh, mechanistic studies and uh, the first of the I guess you'd say good uh, capillary chromatographic separations of Fischer-Krupp's products. Now, in addition in Germany, at Rurkami they developed a, uh, a fixed bed uh, iron Fischer-Krupp's process, which worked very nicely, and uh, it's much better than any of that cobalt process they used during the uh, Second World War. And uh, this was installed at uh, the Sassel plant, this, the Argy units, if you know the field there. And uh, we should mention in passing that the Germans developed the Argy gas, gas generation process and the rectosol gas scrubbing process, which are of technical significance. So let's see what more we have. Oh, in, uh, on the German, but uh, this is a very favorite slide of uh, Professor Kopel. I don't know why I didn't spell it this way in the slide. Uh, th these are his so-called slurry reactors, and really the reason I'm showing you this is that one of these reactors is named Emil, and the other reactor is named France for Emil and France Fisher. <laughs> these were Fisher reactors. I thought I should show you this. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. I, I couldn't I could <laughs> mask him off anyway. But uh, this is about 1950, I guess. Uh, this is uh, Henry Storch, who was the uh, technical genius of the uh, much of the early Bureau of Mines programs. And he was director of research in the, this research and development. He was a great man, and uh, uh, it's been nice if we had him around nowadays. And uh, uh, here's someone that uh, Bert knows, I'm sure, Paul Emmett. Uh, he came to Pittsburgh from to Mellon Institute uh, from Johns Hopkins, and uh, after a while he went back to Johns Hopkins. And uh, he, he did interesting work in the Fisher Truck Synthesis at Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh. Let's see what more we have. Okay, uh, this is sort of the uh, uh, the Pittsburgh <laughs> contribution to the Fisher Truck Synthesis. At Mellon Institute, you had uh, Cumber Hall, Flyholder, who uh, uh, did nice mechanistic studies, uh, somewhat similar to what's going on here. And uh, the rest now here is Bureau of Mines. Uh, Larry Hofer at the Bureau uh, made some sense out of the uh, uh, Fe2C carbides of iron. And uh, I think his early characterization work was fairly good. Uh, Benson and Field worked on uh, oil circulation reactors and uh, on hot gas recycle type reactors. Uh, neither of which has uh, been investigated to any great extent in this last period of uh, development. Martin 
Schlesinger on slurry reactors, and uh, Irving Wender made quite a reputation on uh, carbonyls and organic metallic compounds as well as other work on coal. Oh, okay, let's go back one here. I, I should say, in this period in the U.S., the uh, petroleum companies were working on a different variant of the uh, fisher truck synthesis, a different one than the Germans had used, and the Bureau used, and this was a high temperature process. And uh, they were somewhat enamored by the uh, how nicely the uh, the fluid bed reactors had worked in uh, the World War II plants that were put up for catalytic cracking, and uh, they were trying this process. And these uh, these fluidized bed reactors uh, have to be used at high temperatures, otherwise catalysts will stick together. It has to be high enough it doesn't make any wax or heavy oil that sticks on the surface. And uh, uh, they were doing this, and uh, as I'll mention in a moment, this led to a, a major scale development in Texas and uh, to the uh, Kellogg process that Sasso bought. And these were major developments. And, uh, and these were new ideas. The Germans didn't uh, have processes that work like this at all. <coughs> I wanted to mention two of the things I got involved with. And one was the uh, nitride and iron catalyst. And this is an interesting system. You can start with iron nitrides, which you can get by treating iron with ammonia, reduced iron, and treat it with CO or synthesis gas, and you get a carbon nitride where part of the nitrogen is replaced by carbon. You can start out on the other end, and uh, maybe you modern characters have some other designation, but this is a, a hexagonal carbide, and this is a Hague carbide. And uh, they're approximately Fe2C anyhow. And uh, if you treat these with ammonia, then you'll get these carbon nitrides. And uh, if you try hard enough, you can uh, get more or less all the way across in both ways. So uh, I'm not sure how many people have done that. And the interesting point is that uh, if you treat an iron nitride with uh, hydrogen, you will, you know, at surface temperatures 200 to 250 degrees C, you will take the nitrogen out in an hour of ammonia. But if you have some carbon monoxide along, it will last for uh, six months or more. So this is a selective poisoning of the uh, iron catalyst for this reaction. And uh, these. Uh, Iron nitrides or the carbon nitrides can be used as synthesis catalysts without being depleted of nitrogen rapidly. And uh, they show some interesting. Uh, do I do this? Uh, selectivity changes. This happens to be an iron copper. Uh, about 10% copper, 90% iron, plus potassium as a promoter, precipitated mass. And uh, th these histograms are product distribution, <coughs> starting with gaseous stuff here in weight percent and distillation fractions. This first one is just treated with hydrogen and CO. You know, observe makes uh, about 50% of heavy wax. And uh, if you reduce this catalyst in hydrogen, you find that uh, the wax yield is decreased and the 
yield of gaseous stuff has increased. And if you next uh, take a reduced catalyst and treat of ammonia to, uh, well, that's about Fe4N or Fe2N here, you get a catalyst that makes no wax at all and uh, a lot more gaseous products. And I should tell you one more thing. These are incidentally done with uh, one hydrogen and one CO gas in about 10 atmospheres. And uh, in these blocks, there are numbers marked OH. And th this was our way of getting some sort of a sensible analysis before gas comes to target. And this is a weight percent of OH group calculated uh, from infrared spectroscopy. And uh, what you should observe is that if you go from this reduced catalyst, well, if you, okay, go, you had very little of this gasoline fraction on the inducted catalyst. And this made uh, some OH, these are the form of alcohols mostly. And if you go to the nitride, you get very substantial yields. And we ought to look at the next one of these, and then we'll quit this. If you treat this now, instead of with hydrogen and CO, with pure hydrogen, then the nitrogen comes out, and you go back to making a product, well, somewhere between these two. There's a lot of wax. Not much, well, okay. Not much OH group in these fractions. And so it's uh, behaving like a reduced catalyst. And uh, if you analyze it, it indeed doesn't have much nitrogen left in it. And the other thing I got involved with was. Uh, chain growth processes. And uh, this is really something we did much later. I thought I'd put it on to baffle you or something. Um, the type of molecules you make uh, in the Fisher trucks you can represent by a uh, string of numbers. Or an ordinary CH2 is one uh, a methyl group is two, and if you had enough a group, it would be three, and so forth. And so you can play games. You can put this in the computer and let the computer do it for you, and so forth. And we had a lot of fun at McMaster doing that. Uh, I don't think we advanced science or anything, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> but anyway, if you know what this is about now, uh, this is uh, what I call the simple chain growth process. The, Van der Waals equation for this. And uh, if you allow addition to go on the first or the second carbon from one end, say the right hand end of the chain, and if you add uh, to the end, it has a probability A, and if you add to the next to the end, you have a probability AF. And we don't allow it to. Uh, Draw on this one anymore, otherwise you get quaternary speech, which you don't find. And uh, so anyway, if you call this A F and that A, then uh, the isomer distributions in each fraction come out to be a function only of this parameter F and the uh, carbon number. Well, of the uh, straight chain stuff is uh, given by this series A, A squared, A cubed, so forth. And uh, uh, that does pretty well, anyhow, fitting things. Let's look at it. Uh, this is the data of uh, Professor Schultz, as he sent me a thesis once. 
capture this data on cobalt of one atmosphere. And this is only one of, well, okay, there are a whole group of uh, experiments at different temperatures and different gas compositions. And uh, I did something else here, but really what we're plotting here is the uh, a mole fraction are the moles of the straight chain material, straight chain hydrocarbon. All of them plus uh, paraffins. And uh, these are the so called uh, uh, Schultz uh, Florian plots if you take the Olivet's uh, latter day uh, pronouncements. Anyway, uh, you get fairly nice straight lines on this uh, semi-logarithmic plot, and uh, in general, you find that the uh, C1s are usually too high and the C2s are too low. And uh, often, if you uh, multiply the C2s by two or give them a double growth factor, uh, you can put them up in the line. But otherwise, you do pretty well. And you can, in addition, uh, uh, predict the products. You won't predict any uh, ethyl substituted species, but uh, in this state of Schultz, they only went in the monomethyls. And uh, so uh, we did pretty well here. We set these two equal. And uh, again, the C1s are off. C2s are low if you divide it by 2, you get a number like that. And other than that, you get a nice representation. In some cases, I believe better than the analytical data, but uh, within the experimental uncertainties, anyhow. That's going up to C14. Now, let's get back to the uh, American work of the petroleum industries and uh, the Kellogg Company. A group uh, related to hydrocarbon research was put together to uh, put in a fluidized fisher trups unit on gas made from uh, natural gas down in Brownsville, Texas. And this was a day when uh, natural gas was selling for 10 or 12 cents a thousand cubic feet down here. And uh, they, s they signed up a long-term contract for this gas, and they were going to make money on it, make gasoline out of it. And uh, uh, they didn't design the reactor very well. I, I think in their defense, they, they figured you could do no wrong with a, with a uh, fluidized bed reactor. And they just had a big uh, tube on them about an 18, 20 foot diameter reactor without much uh, of a distribution system at the, the base of the reactor. <coughs> the sad part about this was that. This, this, this was a big plant, and they didn't keep this uh, unit running more than uh, a day or two at any time, over a period of about three or maybe four years, at which time they ran out of money. <coughs> now, the, uh, the Standalone Oil and Gas Company is some kind of a standard company out of Tulsa. I don't know how the names have gone since that time. Uh, they've been doing uh, this kind of research. And they were involved uh, basically on a product separation uh, scheme for uh, separating the products from this process. But uh, they came in and uh, built a new reactor which, uh, well, it doesn't quite, 
didn't quite look like this. I saw it. I attended that autopsy of the uh, plant. Anyway, they had been at cooling tubes extending down from the top. Uh, oh, these were about six inches apart on uh, some kind of a triangular arrangement. And uh, between each of these triangles, you'd have a, a jet at the bottom, which would introduce a gas. And they claimed, and I believe that they operated this for a, a month or six weeks properly. And then they shut the thing down, and they sold the plant and broke, broke it up. And the reason they did this was that this natural gas that they contracted was now selling for about 25 cents per thousand cubic feet, and they could make more money selling the gas than they could putting it through the plant. <laughs> so, anyway, that was the end of uh, the uh, American fish and drops process in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, presumably a good operation for about uh, a month or so. And uh, it's sort of sad. I think most of this data is lost. As somebody who's uh, threatening to write it up. OK, another New Jersey process. Uh, this by uh, the Kellogg Company was an entrained solid uh, unit where you have your your, your solids in a standpipe and they're picked up by the gas stream and they go up here through the reactor. I think this is a not scale very good. That ought to be bigger than that. And through some heat exchangers and uh, through a cyclone back down again, and uh, this was introduced in the, the Sassel plant in South Africa, which was being developed in the late 40s and got going in the early 50s, and uh, anyway, after a year or so of uh, growing pains, this started operating properly, and it's operated ever since. And uh, uh, these are the only kind of reactors that are used in uh, the uh, Sassel 2 and 3. Now, don't hold me to this, folks, but I think this is the uh, Sassel Argy and its fixed bend iron unit in the first Sassel plant. And uh, this is what these uh, Kellogg type uh, train solids units look like. This is in Sassel II, I believe. And I believe it was while it was under construction. I think there's some extra junk around here. And the catalyst comes up and goes around Gooseneck into these standpipes back again. And uh, oh, even though that seems to be quite a laborious process, it has worked nicely and they seem to like it. Okay, what more we have? Well, uh, this is sort of a part of what uh, our chairman. Uh, alluded to about the 1952 election when the Republicans came in. In fact, I've been sort of a traditional Republican all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it was becoming apparent, uh, very apparent in 1955, that the uh, with the Arabian oil and so forth, the world was about up to here in, uh, in oil. And uh, except for uh, work at uh, Brewston uh, and some of Morgantown, uh, most of the Bureau of Mines program was cut back. And uh, that happened all over the world. Uh, 
Germans were doing a lot of things, and uh, they decided they just were going to get out of this coal work at that time. And uh, th this is a lesson, uh, maybe, for uh, people in the present day coal research laboratories. I, I don't know what, uh, I hope you can persuade your administration that you, you have to keep going on this. Anyway, Storch died about this time. He left the bureau and gone to America. Diana missed. I'm just putting this on, not because I understand it, but it's a moss power spectra of, uh, I don't know, iron and cementite. And uh, uh, th this was a new uh, new improvement. And had Larry Hofer had this, he would have done even better with this uh, characterization of the FE2C carbides. And then, uh, come <laughs> In 1972, 73, 74, there was the OPEC uh, petroleum, uh, what shall we call it, embargo. And this German uh, cartoon depicts what uh, uh, the coal chemist was doing. And I just listened to uh, uh, some of the things that uh, I believe have been uh, worthwhile things since this time. I've been telling people that, uh, that my book uh, got out too soon and that really <clears throat> most of these projects that started in 1975 didn't do very much to so this is an enormously complicated business, and it takes about five years to catch up with the literature. And uh, anyway, uh, here are some things that uh, I believe are moderately secure things. Bell, Alex Bell, and Sockware have been uh, working on the carbide theory. Apparently, uh, these people in some of Exxon have been finding out that uh, data that indicates that the carbon chain grows almost instantaneously. It doesn't work like uh, Dotsonberg thought it did. You know, putting on a one carbon atom every minute or something in the growing chain, it uh, occurs almost instantaneously. And the, the light uh, pedal that uh, Texas did some nice work showing CO2, CH2s can be an intermediate chain growth schemes. McCandlish is of interest. Wojciechowski is uh, working on some exotic things. I'll show you a slide on this. Uh, th these uh, Germans feel that if you isolate the iron atoms uh, thoroughly, uh, that you can get primary products out of the uh, reaction, which turn out to be awful. And uh, uh, Bureau of Mines work has been contributing some new ideas, and Satterfield has worked with a slurry reactor, and uh, you didn't get your bones. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let, let's look at uh, uh, th th this is work of uh, Hans Schultz that I thought was always very nice. It was uh, early uh, gas chromatography, and they, they've done some nice things in Crossford. And what you ought to see is so what are we doing here? Uh, we're getting the mole percent of olefins in uh, each carbon number fraction as a function of the carbon number. And you ought to look at this one up here. And I guess that's the same one. With a lot of manganese in it. And uh, here you see at all carbon numbers you get about 86% uh, 
olefins and eats the fractions. And uh, the next slide is here. Uh, the fraction of these olefins that are alpha olefins uh, uh, for this one that's isolated by a lot of manganese oxides. You see, you have almost 100% alcohol. And I, I should have told you that with other iron catalysts, that is not the case. It uh, changes in these quantities. And they think they have been able to uh, isolate the primary product of the synthesis. I was saying today that uh, somebody ought to check on alcohol. These uh, metals relic is furnished in these slides that occur in a German, these cartoons that occur in a German trade journal. This is a sequel to the other one. How's your German? <laughs> anyway, he's saying it appears to uh, Again, that the customer is coming to buy some this off. And this says that this is a, this is a winter sale due to overfilling. So, anyway, that's a battle one has to worry about in all this business. Well, to continue in fairly recent times. Sasso has constructed units two and three. They're apparently working nicely now. <coughs> this mobile process is, we can introduce that in the next slide, uh, is going in New Zealand, and uh, here are the prices, plus as we saw in the cartoon. And uh, one more. Well, you're probably all familiar with the ZSM-5 and what it does to methanol to convert it to octane gasoline and, and no waxes and other bad things that you get from pressure drop synthesis. And it's, uh, it's a nice process. And you probably defied the heat of reaction of two parts here, which might make the engineering easier. And, uh, clear at Lehigh, and we have been playing with the higher alcohol synthesis on alkalized catalysts, methanol-type catalysts. And uh, uh, this is a process where you add carbon atoms at the, uh, most of the time at the second carbon atom, not at the first. And you sort of run out of places to put them at. And uh, so you, you get a lot of ice so butyl alcohol and uh, some C5 and C6 as major products. And uh, they might be nice things for uh, uh, octane enhancer for the immediate future. Going to get rid of that. And uh, the Snam Jetty Company and. Italy is now doing this commercially to some extent. Anyhow, I think they have a big demonstration point going. Oh, I thought we'd show you that in uh, case uh, <laughs> any of you are starting up. This might save you the five years starting time. Uh, I just wanted to spend uh, five more minutes on uh, Thermodynamics things, as I gave a talk at Bert's uh, Emmett conference on thermal. And this now gives you the free energy change as a function of temperature per carbon product for a reaction producing water, except for, except for methanol. Uh, as a function of 
temperature. And what you should see is that for all these different molecules except the uh, acetylene, formaldehyde, that the uh, energy change is pretty good. This is the type of reaction, say two hydrogen plus one CO to give uh, uh, something plus water. So the thermodynamics is pretty good. But uh, then you want to look at a slide like this. Uh, this is what happens on ruthenium catalyst when you put normal hexane on at 150 degrees centigrade and atmospheric pressure. And what you should see is, I'll tell you, is that you're cracking this hydrocarbon at a at a merry rate, and you're making uh, all these products: pentane, uh, butane, uh, okay, propane, ethane, and methane. So, so what, what is going on here? Uh, this is the fissure trough catalyst that's uh, whittling normal hexane down to size. And we made some thermodynamic calculations in which we included all these molecules. We ignore all that stuff. But all the molecules you see were included. Plus uh, water and CO2 and uh, different gas compositions. And you solve this by trial and error procedures. And, uh, okay, what are we doing? You know, it's, this is different uh, feed gases at different temperatures. And you can do a lot of things in a computer. Uh, different pressures. We're not making any fugacity uh, corrections here. But, uh, and uh, here we're plotting the products you get on a mole percent basis with water and CO2 excluded. And, uh, okay, one is methane here. And two is ethane. And uh, these dotted lines is the conversion of hydrogen plus CO. <coughs> and let me tell you, that that's all pretty close to 100%, all those dotted lines. And of course, the methanes are pretty close to being 100%. And uh, as I say here, say you're in green, uh, that methane is virtually the only product <laughs> that, that you get. Except over in this end, when you put in uh, one, let's say one hydrogen plus two, two COs, there isn't enough hydrogen there to make all methane. <laughs> and uh, that, that's the reason that there isn't 100% methane in this first. And, uh, So anyway, the moral is this story is that if you have a catalyst that uh, is uninhibited, it is going to make only methane. That is uh, thermodynamically a uh, stable product. And if you get anything else, it's by the grace of God. And it's by the grace of uh, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, I think. metal catalyst. Uh, I, I think there are other things that go on in uh, in the methanol synthesis. I don't think these catalysts will uh, do any hydrogen analysis anyhow. Anyway, this is my last slide. Uh, Jacques Manier was doing hydrogen analysis in our laboratory of heck, well of, lo of smaller hydrocarbons. And uh, on iron, and he found that uh, his 
results were most uninteresting because he got virtually 100% of nothing in every experiment. And so I said, well, why don't you take a real big molecule? And it'll be remarkable if you get 100% nothing there. And uh, uh, some of this is uh, distortion of the capillary gas chromatography that I don't understand, but uh, this is uh, this is the hexadecane up here in C15, see, 14, 13, 12, 11. And uh, anyway, with his iron catalyst at uh, 320 degrees centigrade, he got this kind of a pattern with a lot of uh, methane produce, but uh, all these intermediate products. And then he put 3% CO in with this hydrogen. And you see, uh, you don't get much uh, cracking at all anymore. And you don't, you, you still make a reasonable amount of methane, presumably by hydrogenating this CO, but uh, you don't, uh, and so that is the end, that's the final a moral lesson, and uh, anyway, we hope that in the future uh, uh, research such as going on here will be continued, and that uh, you won't be a part of these awful roller coaster rides that uh, uh, occur. And I think it's in surely the, the interest of the state of Kentucky and uh, the United States. I'm still a U.S. citizen, so I can say that. Uh, but uh, uh, research of the kind you have going on here being a continuing thing. And, uh, I was citing Japan, that uh, has no uh, coal or any other fossil fuel, and they have a whole program of this stuff uh, going on on a continuing basis uh, at the Tuscoupa Park. I hope that will surely occur here and other places in the U.S. Thank you. going on here.